Um, good evening. Um, welcome, everybody. Fantastic to see so many happy, friendly faces on this Thursday uh, evening in February for what is actually our first 6x6 virtual social of 2021. Um, hope you're all surviving the privations of lockdown and finding ways to keep yourself amused and safe at the same time. Um, I'm going to come on to our guest in a moment and speak a little bit about Sophie Gerrard. But uh, first, there is a special announcement on behalf of 6x6. We want to draw attention to a little bit of success in as much as the World Photography Organization Sony Photography Awards nominations have been uh, made public this afternoon and our very own Craig Easton, not content with just securing one nomination for Thatcher's children work, he has also had a second nomination for his bank top work um, from Blackburn. So two great stories, two great sets of images and um, Due recognition, I think, for Craig's outstanding diligence, hard work and creativity over the last um, few years. So we're, we're very proud of what he's achieved and keeping our fingers crossed that you never know, he might, might pull off one of the big prizes, which would be fantastic. So well done, Craig. Well, well done. Thank you, Colin. You never said you were going to dump that one on me, but thank you very much. indeed. <laughs> but tonight's about Sophie. Let's hear Sophie's work. But thank you. OK, OK, OK. Point taken. So yes, moving on to Sophie Gerrard, um, I have to declare um, an interest here, of course, because Sophie is one of the, my fellow members of Document Scotland, myself, Sophie and Jeremy Sutton Hibbert. So I've known Sophie for nearly 10 years since we set up Document Scotland in 2012. Um, during that time, of course, we've uh, worked on numerous projects, sort of in tandem. We tend not to work together on the same projects, but we work in tandem over, um, shall we say, themes, and we illustrate themes in our own particular brilliant way. Sophie's work um, has therefore been exhibited in a number of very high profile and prestige locations over the last seven or eight years, including um, at the Scottish National Portrait Gallery in Edinburgh, the Martin Parr Foundation, Impressions Gallery, um, and also abroad. We've had a couple of shows um, that have gone abroad as well. Um, Sophie is uh, an accomplished editorial photographer, but I think she's really defined by her longer term projects. Um, if you haven't, and I'm sure you all are familiar with Drawn to the Land, her long project, um, which is really an intimate study of women farming and when women, women farmers in Scotland. Um, it's a project that has taken her across the country and she has executed in, it, and in her own way, in an own inimitable way, in that very sensitive and caring way that Sophie brings to her photography, which really communicates itself to audiences, uh, not just in Scotland, but um, further afield as well. She's going to talk about another longer term project that she's been working on for a couple of years called The Flows. So I'm not gonna say anything about it, but it's, um, it's a, it's a project which she shot and prepared for the uh, for our um, show, A Contested Land, which premiered at the Martin Parr Foundation two years ago and then spent the rest of 2019 um, sort of traveling various locations and uh, exhibitions, festivals across Scotland and England. Um, so I'm very, um, I've heard her speak about this project before and she's absolutely brilliant and very informative. So without further ado, I'd like to just throw the, uh, digital floor open to Sophie and um, welcome you and thank you for being our guest speaker tonight. Hmm. Thanks Colin, very nice introduction. Um, it's nice to see, thank you so much all of you for being here this evening. It's nice to see so many people, slightly um, nerve wracking but bear with me. So <laughs> I'm gonna um, take you through this project, The Flows, which as Colin said, I, did, I began um, in time to, to show at the Martin Parr Foundation and share my screen. And I've lost all concept of time. So thank you for reminding me that it was two years ago. It's difficult to remember. So basically um, the flow country for those of you that don't know is in the very kind of far north of Scotland uh, in Caithness in Sutherland. And it's a very flat part of Scotland, which I think quite often we assume the further north we go, um, the more mountainous it gets. But 
this part of Scotland in the northeast is very flat and it's a vast uh, blanket peat, peat bog, which is a very kind of globally rare habitat. And for me, I wanted to, I've been photographing women in the landscape over the last few years. And I wanted to kind of change cameras. I wanted to slow down a little bit. I wanted to work with large formats. And the flow country was a place that um, in my childhood actually was somewhere we'd been driven through as children on the way to family kind of holidays up on the very far North coast. We had friends there. And it was always kind of driven through as this bleak landscape of nothingness and there's nothing there. And it's definitely how it was talked about, which I think it's quite unusual. So I was given a few editorial assignments um, uh, just about two and a half years ago, and they took me back up to the very far north of Scotland, which is a place I hadn't, hadn't been back to since I was a child. And I was driving through the flow country, and you can't see <laughs> the, the slides I've started on right now are very, very low down and, and looking at the ground from the inside, really. But as we go through the project, you'll see the kind of uh, the scope of the landscape. And um, and I, yeah, I had the excuse to go back to this place. And often, you know, long-term projects begin in very varied ways. And I just loved driving through this vast flat place and thought I really want to make a new body of work in this place. Oops, there we go. So um, I started researching. My projects always begin with research. And what I hadn't realized was that the flow country was undergoing one of the biggest kind of environmental projects, I suppose, in the country at the time. Um, blanket peat, peat bog is a very kind of rare habitat and is really vital in combating char uh, climate change. It's a carbon sink. And in the 80s, the, the, these big empty spaces in inverted commas, these big areas of nothingness, of low production, according to the government, were, um, were planted and to make them more productive. And now that kind of destroyed the bog. So the, the conservation that's being done there now is to remove the plantation and to kind of look to restore this peatland back to, back to what it should be, which is a flooded landscape, which stores, stores peat and therefore stores carbon. So visually, I, I went out there exploring with my 5.4 camera and I really wanted to show the kind of the layers of the landscape and almost photograph it from the inside. I wasn't quite sure why, but I was drawn to these amazing sidings, I suppose, these cuttings through the peat. So in some areas, it can be nine meters deep or more, I think. Um, and deep peat is a protected kind of landscape. We're not meant to be developing it or, or you know, planting it or working it or removing it. So, I would travel all over the flow country as much as I could and try not to get stuck in the bog or with this big heavy camera get sinking down into it, which wasn't always easy. And I worked there for over the course of, well, I guess about a year or so in different seasons, trying to, I guess, trying to explore the, the depths and the layers of the landscape. So that's what these, these images do. And scale's quite a strange, strange thing out in this landscape. It's quite hard to photograph, um, hard, quite hard to kind of communicate a sense of scale of the place. But I quite like that. I like that you, it's a bit ambiguous. You're not quite sure what you're looking at. And these were printed really large. You'll see later on some installation shots, but these were printed quite big. So they're almost kind of life-size when the audience is looking at them. So here we are back on top of on top of the landscape. So peelands cover only a tiny amount of the planet's land surface, about 3%, but they hold almost 30% of all terrestrial carbon, which is pretty massive. And if you want something to compare that to, it's almost twice as much as all the world's forests. So this area of nothing, in inverted commas, is doing a pretty important job. So up on the top of the landscape here, I'm photographing the, um, the old forestry sites where the Sitka spruce that was planted in the 80s has been chopped down, pulled out. It's 
squashed back down all the branches of the brash it's called has been kind of squashed back into the drainage ditches in order to um, re-flood the areas. And it's not particularly pretty, I guess. You know, at some points you look like you're kind of walking through or driving through these areas of logging and there's just piles of piles of logs and piles of, of um, brash and it's pretty, it's pretty brutal. But for me, just being out in the big wide open spaces were just quite remarkable, really. The scale is extraordinary. So this is shot in a place called Forsenard, which is RSPB um, nature reserve. So the RSPB really helped me make this project. They're the lead partner on the deforestation and the restoration of the peat bogs in, Force, in um, the flow country. So the access they gave me was really key to making this project and the time. And so I would, I would go up there and stay in a field center in the middle of nowhere, um, quite bizarre, quite strange to be there at nighttime, especially in the winter where it got dark at about 2.45 and it got light at about 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, but here, yeah, you, there's a viewing center. So you can really, this viewing tower gives you an elevated perspective over these, these are called do lochens, which means black, black loch. And they're just beautiful, these pools. And it's a very undulating flat land. And I think, I think for people that don't know it, it's a surprise that, you know, up in the very far north of Scotland, we're not on the west coast. So we're not on the rugged west coast where it's mountainous. You are in this flat, almost, at first glance, I guess, featureless landscape. But really, I think once you've studied it and you've spent a bit of time there, you realise how rich it is in kind of geographical, um, physical kind of attributes, but also, I don't know, it's a very eerie, emotional place. I, you know, spending quite a lot of time out on the, the bog, I found really poetic and I kind of got and tried to think about the stories that might be there and the mythology and um, what this landscape mean, means to people now and meant to people, you know, centuries ago. So the flow country, yeah, it's considered to be the largest expanse of blanket peat bog in the world. Um, in Scotland, it forms the largest store of carbon on land, 1.7 billion tonnes, equivalent to 140 years worth of Scotland's annual greenhouse gases. So it is a kind of strange mixture of these quite industrial um, industrial goings on really with this almost, I don't know, this quite post-apocalyptic in some ways landscape. And you're kind of wondering, you know, what happened here? It's pretty brutal. But what I hadn't appreciated until I started making these visits was the kind of cutting edge science that's happening here. So because of the extent of the peat bogs, um, which is, you know, not there's not many examples of this all over the world. You have scientists and experts and researchers from all over the world coming to study it. The way that they are compartmentalizing it and um, restoring it area by area is, is being studied and reflected upon to measure the success of that. So the science is pretty, pretty zeitgeist, which is always quite exciting. So in the 1980s, the Thatcher government um, offered tax incentives to the super rich, I suppose, which meant that huge areas of this, this land that was deemed to be unproductive was planted with um, Sitka spruce. And, I, and, it, and it killed the bog, it, it drained it really. And it, over 80% of the UK's peatlands have been damaged by years of a similar kind of mismanagement. So either planting or drainage, inappropriate development, excavation of peat for fuel, um, forestry and grazing. So the landscape completely changes in the winter. I really, you know, it's important to me to visit it 
in as many seasons as I could. And I really wanted to be there this year. The 2020 was going to be the year of, uh, of getting back up there. It doesn't look very likely for a while. But it's an overlooked landscape. I think that's what maybe attracts me to it. They say that photographers are attracted to edge lands and uh, the edges of either society or community or landscape or, you know, physical geography. And I think a landscape which has been mismanaged, mistreated, um, misunderstood maybe, had an attraction to me too. So spending a lot of time in this place has been, has been really enjoyable. And scenes that I need to get, definitely, you can see little smatterings of it here, but the wee white spots are, you'll have seen it, cotton grass, which just when it comes for a very short time, I think it just happens in June. It just covers the landscape like snow. It's just beautiful. So that's a, a picture that I still need to get. So people are always part of my projects. And even when I try and make work that doesn't have any people in them, I can't really help myself. So part of the kind of exploration of the landscape was also trying to understand, I don't know, who, who maybe who had a relationship to it, who, who felt that they were, they were part of this landscape and what their stories were too. So I spent quite a lot of my time on my visits meeting people who either worked on the flow country or near it, or were involved in its um, protection and conservation in some ways. So this is Heather, who's a farmer on the north side of the flow country. And her father still runs the farm, but she's kind of, you know, being primed to to take over and her conservation and ecological kind of sympathies I suppose are quite different to her father's so it's quite important that the next generation are a bit more progressive in their thinking. This is Becky who works with the RSPB and she's an outreach worker so she works with local primary schools and the community to try and again educating the next generation. I think when you've got centuries and all this time of mismanagement of a place, change happens quite slowly. And the only way to do that really is to look to the newest generation coming in. Caroline was somebody who helped me quite a lot when I was working there and she was running um, a project called Flow to the Future, which I think has just ended, but again, was all about the development of this particular reserve to try and attract people to the place. And then there's the RSPB, conservation volunteers. So they stay up in Forsenard for a year at a time, which is quite an extraordinary thing to do. It's definitely in the middle of nowhere. And uh, yeah, they, they help on the reserve. They, they learn about conservation of the place. This is Jake and he was helping a group of volunteers with, um, remove uh, with putting dams into the the drainage ch uh, channels so there are these <clears throat> when the when the land is planted with trees you'll have seen it in in the countryside they dig big drainage channels either side of the rows of the trees and these all have to be kind of filled in and dammed and blocked so that they they reflood and the markers here are made of bamboo there's a quite a lot of um, thinking around not putting too much plastic back out into the landscape. So a lot of the conservation work that's being done is also being done with natural materials. This was Fairly, she's another volunteer. And Robbie, who was only 16, but spoke like a politician, he was remarkable. Had really extraordinary opinions on conservation and why it was important and the future of the planet. So it's quite, you know, quite positive, really positive thinking, I think, was going on in places like this. And it's easy to get caught up in the doom and gloom of what's not happening to our planet and what we're not doing right and what's going wrong. And I think coming to places like this, it's just very positive. There's so much energy and so much dynamic thinking. This was clear. 
um, one of the wardens working with the damming of the drainage channels. Garode and his job was quite interesting. He had to be the diplomat, I suppose, working with, so it, the flow country is surrounded by quite a lot of large estates. Um, it's Mackay country, you enter, you enter this part of Sutherland and there's a big stone with a carving in it saying you're entering Mackay country. You know, this quite, it feels quite, you feel like the, the, the clans of the past are kind of tapping you on the shoulder. So there's a bit of politics, there's a bit of land, land issue politics to be dealt with and Gray's job was to, Gray's job, sorry, was to, was to be the, the go-between between, between the conservation projects and the and the landowners because one can't work without the other, I guess. Paul, another RSPB warden working on the reserve full time. And this is Sandra, um, who lived her whole life. She was born in a cottage on the Strath and she's lived there her whole life. And she had lots of stories and songs and mythological kind of tales to tell of the landscape and I think for me the net this project is unfinished I should add it so it's it's ongoing it's not finished there's a lot of pictures I still want to get and the next phase of it which I'm in the process of applying for funding for is to is to explore that kind of mythological more um what's the word allegorical kind of storytelling side of the landscape to try and find out more about those things. So I'm gonna stop here and Colin was gonna ask me some questions, I think, weren't you Colin? Yeah, I, I am, thank you. I mean, it's just lovely to see that work. Every time I look at it, I see something new in it and something interesting that you either see or I, I notice from not just the landscape, which landscapes which have just this incredible texture to them and the scale to them, but also the people as well. That, I think you capture you capture the mood of the place in their in their you know in their expressions and their and the way where you photograph them. It's really interesting. Um, I wanted to I just wanted to sort of if you like go back to the start and ask you because you trained in environmental science. That was was your wasn't that your degree? It's certainly your background. I just wondered if that has um, helped you in a way or, or kind of allowed you to have a deeper, clearer understanding of the issues around, if you like, the environmental part of this story? Um, yeah, I think so. I think most photographers have either an overarching uh, theme or um, aspect to their work that they follow, whether it's people or community or news, or it doesn't really matter what it is. And, and I think for me, it's definitely working with environmental stories and looking to explore visually maybe our relationship with our landscape. Um, and I, I feel I'm only just starting to do that over the last few years with my photography. I was, did environmental sciences back in, God, I can't remember, 2000, I think it was a long time ago. So coming back to it now means I have this new approach, I think, of exploring the subjects that I'm passionate about, but doing it you know, very visually and in a way that suits me and, and working in environmental science. I remember just being out on these amazing sites with a clipboard and a pencil and thinking, I don't, you know, I don't really know if I'm making the right decisions. This is right. I don't think science is for me. It's too binary and I'm much more kind of open. You know, I want to, I want to look at the nuance and I want to look at the emotional side of a story. So, you know, even looking at these four images here, there's these kind of sidings or cross sections of the peat bog for me that really opens up the story of what's going on there you know like um peatlands are you know they're ancient places and uh their stories are really rich and multi-layered and i want to talk about all those layers you know i want to talk about the the story and the poetry and the myths and the history as well as the environmental protection and the um, the science and the conservation and I just yeah so it's the best of both worlds I think working with a visual medium like photography as well as having that environmental background. Yeah and I mean um, 
it kind of, you know, you touched also on the kind of politics of land. And I think that's something that, uh, you know, we in Document Scotland are very kind of exercised. And it's not politics with a capital P, although, you know, that does stray into it. There's a lot, you know, the, if you think of all the um, land reform legislation that's gone through um, in the parliament in the last um, 15 years, you know, that great progress and great change has happened and is continuing to happen. Um, you know, and, and then I look at this work and I wonder, you know, this, this takes, you know, when you think about sort of politically documenting the landscape, then you are talking about strictly documentary photography. Whereas when I look at this, um, it seems to take the notion of politics or environmentalism or even science and then kind of take it to a different, a different level even. Um, but certainly taking it in different direction, but still, I would, I would suggest, you know, you, you are still fairly true to the idea that, that there are, are political issues around the land in Scotland. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm no politician and I'm no kind of um, expert on any of that. And I, I find the land debates on my Twitter feed is quite interesting. It's full of farmers, artists, <laughs> um, land experts, politicians, and it's quite an interesting mix. And they often, they just clash, you know, there's so much polemic. The rural communities and, and those that are custodians of our rural landscape versus those who are dwelling in urban areas and maybe responsible for the politics. It seems so, so kind of clashing. And I, and I think, I don't know where I would sit in those conversations. I don't enjoy the confrontation but I think it's again it's the nuance right so the best debates come where you have really forward-thinking farming communities for example working with conservation groups and individuals who are sympathetic to everybody's kind of needs and there's loads of people working that way so yeah it is political but my I think the primary language that I use is a visual one and if you can use that visual language to draw somebody in and make them look at something, then the debate and the conversation and the facts and the science and everything can come in the caption if they choose to read it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I think what you are producing here is a creative response to, you know, to the issues, which I think is really interesting. And you, so you're not losing sight of it, but at the same time, um, you know, the, the, you are producing something which is uniquely you and your take on it which is fantastic. And this, just um, looking at this, um, so the, the flows was part of, there were four, uh, four of us back in those, in those days. There's some, some bloke on the left-hand side, I'm not sure who that is. I think I recognize him from somewhere. <laughs> um, that's, for those who don't know, that is Martin Parr, and that's the opening of the, of a contested land at the Martin Parr Foundation in January, 2019. Um, I think the work, all of the work in that show had, you know, got, got a good response. But I think, I think your work has, has been the, has been the one project that seems to offer, I think, a little bit more longevity. And you did talk about the fact that you want to go back and do more. And do you yeah. think you will then integrate maybe other aspects of it? I mean, you talked about the kind of mythology. Do you think you'll, you'll go down the route of, of gathering testimonies, you know, audio visual stuff, or, or will you just stick to photography? Yeah, I think there'll definitely be an incorporation of, um, if I get the funding that I've applied for, then um, that includes asking a bit more of the landscape and trying to understand a little bit more of its nuance and its story, but also its history and its science, you know, trying to, trying to gather all that material. And I think the scope for including, um, you know, for example, kind of the maps of the area, which are quite remarkable, even the maps that the scientists are using for the, the conservation of the area are quite beautiful. Um, the recordings of deep peat and where some of these places, it can, you know, goes down to nine meters or more. Um, those kind of visuals can be quite beautiful. I wanna kind of scrape away at the surface a little bit more. It's easy to keep on working in the similar visual style to one that you've always done. So for me, that's landscapes and people. And actually, I think working with large format as some of you do here, you know, it slows you right down and it gives you more time to think. So there's different ways of telling stories. And uh, 
yeah, I really look forward to the opportunity to exploring those and to working with maybe mentors or different kind of curators and editors and people like that who can bring things out of the work that I may not have seen. So yeah, it is me going in a slightly different direction, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you, you also touched a little bit about the kind of intricacies and the sort of technical stuff, but, uh, and you mentioned the camera, and that was the first time you'd really explored using a, <laughs> a camera like that. What, what, what are the kind of unique challenges for you for that? Really heavy and it sinks into the peat bog. Like that's the main challenge that you walk around and suddenly you're on your own out on a peat bog by yourself. Hopefully you've left the car key on the arch of the wheel and not taken it out into the bog. And suddenly you're up to your thigh in a puddle with a camera over your shoulder that's very expensive. And uh, yeah, try not to end up like that horse in the never ending story. I don't know. <laughs> Yes, but you, can't, you can't travel very far, can you, on foot, really, in, in a peat bog? I mean, it's... No, it's easier in the winter when it's frozen. It's remarkably easy to walk across. Um, and then other challenges were things like, oh, midges, I can show you. We'll go forward. This, so this was, there was midges, it was the summer, and they would get in the camera, so they were in between the dark slide and the lens. And that was something that I didn't remember ever learning about at camera school. No, would you would you then um, when you were looking at the prints, if they if they had little midgy dots, yeah. would you be spotting those out, or is it got to be a true record of what happened there and you I, leave the midges in? I may have, I may have, uh, I may have cloned them out. <laughs> That's entirely um, understandable. I wish somebody could clone them out full stop. <laughs> and then, but it was it was brilliant because you you have to go slow and you can't take very many pictures, and a day's work might be six photographs you know and I think that discipline is really it changes how you make work and I know that you know we don't like talking about cameras too much because that gear conversation can be quite dry but I think when you you go between a handheld 35 mil and a tripod um you know 5.4 or Craig Easton's using 10.8 you know it changes the photographs are completely different because of the pace that you have to move at and think at and shoot at. And, and I love that slowing down. It gives me more time to think. And uh, that's where the space comes, I think. The space to think about all these other elements. And the scale, when you blow these up, they're kind of pin sharp and huge. And that's very satisfying. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. So this was Perth, Perth Museum, yeah. where a contested land went to, which was great to see it in this space as well. Yeah, they made a lovely job of it, didn't they? And then there's just a few pictures of me out in the landscape. These were taken. So Paul and I went to the other side of the reserve one day. They were great. The, you know, what I love about photography too, when you become kind of embedded in a place or a community or wherever is the lengths that people go to, to, to help you out because they're, they love it. You know, they're so proud of where they work. And so Paul would drive me to the other side of the reserve and, you know, it might look exactly the same, but it was just, it's just quite a different sort of feeling over there. And then I was working on six, seven for a while as well for some of the portraits, so. And I mean, I suppose you, you know, as you get used to, I mean, as you, as you get used to the landscape, you'll start to see the nuances in the landscape. I think so. And the colors change and the seasons and stuff like that. So beginning the project, it was a bit unpredictable of when I was gonna go and what kind of pictures I was gonna get and stuff. But, um, but now I think I'd be able to know you know, when, when to go back to get which kind of pictures and, and what I needed. And also got to know the reserve quite well. You know, I did spend a lot of time driving around it and try not to get stuck <clears throat> too often because I was out there by myself, which is a bit, a bit dangerous, I think. But, um, but yeah, got to know which parts of it had these beautiful features, like these big cuttings and the, the deep peat. And then, and it goes right up to the coast as well. So you could go, go and look at the puffins at Puffin Cave and all that kind of thing as well. So quite a varied place I'd recommend a visit oh it's, it's phen phenomenal and of course there's uh, you can get the train can't you, you can get the train oh right yeah there. so I think one of the most remote um train stations in the whole of the UK is just behind me actually in this picture and uh so it, the train stops at Forsenard which is remarkable there's literally a telegraph pole a cottage and this field this RSPB field centre and a ghosty hotel which looks like something like The Shining 
which wasn't spooky at all when I was staying there completely by myself in the middle of winter and the deer were coughing at me through the window. It just sounded like people. It was all quite scary. Um, and then, yeah, and then there's just, and then there's nothing, there's nothing there. This little two carriage choo-choo train comes along every day. So yeah, you can get the train there. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, a seven I suspect it's a place we might all um, metaphorically have been in the last year, but we'd probably like to visit in the next year. Yeah, it does have a bit of a post-apocalyptic look about it at times. And and the people that work there, you know, following them on social media during lockdown, it's been an extraordinarily strange experience for them because the reserves were all closed and probably still are right now. And yet, arguably, surely that's the most space you could ever get anywhere in the UK, I'd have thought. So it uh, must be quite strange, even emptier than usual. Well, thanks very much, Sophie. Um, that, that was really great, really interesting. Um, lots to think about, obviously, and um, I'm sure I'm sure our audience really enjoyed it as much as I have tonight. And thank you again for giving up your time and speaking to Six by Six. And if you want to keep in touch with us, we'll probably have another um, virtual social at some point in the next few weeks. Just keep in touch with us on social media or through our mailing list, and we'll look forward to seeing you very, very soon again. Thanks and good night.